Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tons of Productions podcast on this Monday, August 19th, 2019. Today, I talk with Kendry Upton. She is the executive director of the Directors Guild of Canada and a self-proclaimed film brat. She grew up in film with both her parents involved in it and has been a member of the DGC for 30 years. Um, she is very, very knowledgeable about this uh, industry and also has an extreme passion and loves it immensely and it's really refreshing so it's a fantastic interview and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did for sure so here you go here is Kendry Upton You are listening to the Tons of Productions podcast. And sound is speeding. Hello, Kendry. How are you? Hello, I'm great. That is great. Um, I uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I know it's really busy right now in the film industry in Vancouver and um, uh, or probably across the country and. Um, I was. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. Well, it's a delight, and thank you so much for having me. All right. Um, so um, the first thing I usually do is touch on uh, where people are from when I interview them, and uh, I was reading your biography on the DGC thing, and I saw that you, were, um, you came up in Delta on River Road. That's right. Yeah, I, live in a, I lived in a um, heritage house in, in Ladner when I was... Uh, uh, growing up, my mom ran a uh, horse boarding stable there, but she also co-produced films with my dad for his production company and edited. Yeah, you but, you were in film right from your being a kid. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I did some like you know uh, bits and pieces, not so much in film. I did a couple of my dad's uh, productions. I wasn't really in film. I did a couple of ads and stuff, print ads. But okay. uh, my parents were, um, my dad's a writer, producer, director in Vancouver, now retired, long retired. And mm-hmm. my mom was, started out co-producing with him and editing for his films and then eventually became a publicist. So, and my brother blows things up. Yeah. For film, I should, should add that caveat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Special effects. Yeah, that's right. Wow. So the whole yeah. family got right into the, the industry. It's really mm-hmm. wild, eh? That's right. So my, it's funny because. You know, people are always like, how did you get into film? And, and, you know, are you a film buff? And I got into film just out of some, you know, desperate attempt to be able to converse at the dinner table with my <laughs> <laughs> So you understood? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, so so when you grew up in the in Delta, in the um, that area, it was like farmland back in those days, right? When, yeah, when you were a kid? And- and actually, funnily enough, it hasn't changed that particular area of Ladner, but for the many, many greenhouses that are there now, hasn't changed that much from when I was growing up. The subdivision okay. houses sort of go right up to the spot where our house is, and then beyond that, it's larger properties and, and farmland. So, yeah, it's, it's it's not that different, actually. Oh, okay. Out towards the Rifle Refuge, out towards the, the Left Island Bridge. So, so the city is what's grown, or you've noticed a lot of change within the city, like yeah, Richmond defi- and Vancouver. I've definitely and... noticed an enormous amount of change, like in other parts of Ladner, has grown enormously, and the city okay. of Vancouver is is so so different from when I used to live downtown. But uh, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Um, and and uh, was it uh, uh, now you live in the city? Now you've moved into the city. Uh, I actually, you're... it's funny when I, when I grew up at the far west end of River Road West, and I now live at the close to the far east end of River Road East, basically. Oh. <laughs> I live um, in Annieville in uh, North Delta. Oh, okay. So yeah. you uh, prefer wider open spaces and uh, more... Well, where I live now is very much a subdivision. Um, oh, okay. But it just, you know, I just bought out there years ago, and I certainly like the quiet quietness of being out of the city. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you went to film school at all. I did not. Okay. I did not. I I joined the industry against my my dad's wishes. <laughs> at, he was like, age, "Don't do it." Yeah, at the age of nineteen, he was not very um, encouraging 
of me getting into the industry. I think he saw it as a very, at the time, that was many years ago, and I think he really feared for how seasonal it was and that it might not be something that would be, you know, supportive for the long haul. So he was not super encouraging at first, but, you know, it, in true kid fashion, I was like, yeah, if my dad says I can't do it, it's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> And I got in and um, and took off from there. So I joined, you know, like I was 19 years old and I started as a PA and uh, joined the Permity program, worked through the same kind of program that everybody does now. It was a little bit shorter right. uh, to join the DDC and um, went up through the ranks and became a location manager, which, uh, you know, a department I was with for 30, just about exactly around 30 years. Yes, I know. That was blew me mind when I when I uh, checked out your IMDb and checked out your uh your uh, your history and bio and all that there you've done it for quite a few years and yeah. um, uh, when you first started um, it wasn't obviously as big as it is now no it was a uh, it was much more seasonal in in some respects although I have to say you know my personal experience has been really really fortunate I've had very very few periods over that course of that 30 years where I was not working very consistently and um, really only one lengthy chunk of time off that I can think of and um, have been really so fortunate to work on so many amazing films with so many and and television projects with so many amazing people Um, you know Tron and Watchmen and um, you know even even you know the television projects that I've done more recently toward before I took this job toward the end of my work in locations like working on Bates Motel which is just such a fabulous experience. With oh, and Ray. I knew a lot of people that worked on that show, and they were really great people. It must yeah. have been a treat to work on that show. It really was, and and also just you know such a cool iconic story to be working on, and such a neat take on it. So, yeah. yeah, and I'm I'm surprised no one had done anything until now. You know, because that, that movie was when <laughs> I was a kid, and all these remakes seemed to be happening from these old stories. Yeah, not that one until then. Yeah, <laughs> but back then though, uh, there was like there was only so many uh, productions going on in Vancouver at a time. Like, was there? 10, I'd say. Or... Yeah, I mean, I, I would look back on occasionally when, like, when we moved to this office, we were going through old production lists, and you'd find a production list that would have, like, five productions on it. <laughs> it's, and, you know, our, our height of busiest, I think, 57 productions wow. is, is what we've listed on our list at our, our busiest. So, yeah, we've come a hell of a long way, oh, for shit. sure. Ten times. Ten yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, so was it mostly uh, films and stuff? Um, m- well, my career really ran the gamut. I have done quite a few uh, film productions, but I've also done lots of television over the years, um, some TV movies. When I first started out as a location manager, I felt like I was only making television movies at the Vancouver airport for a little while there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I've, I've mixed it up. A lot, and and the other thing is, I've spent quite a lot of time in my um, career teaching locations to the guild. I was to people within the guild. I was uh, the author of the original apprenticeship program for the locations department, and that was like back in the early two thousand. Oh yeah, no, it says it on your on your bio here uh, uh, that you were a teacher in the field of locations. So that's great. Did mm-hmm. you like do a set etiquette thing, or is it just for locations? Um, I did actually teach with Sandra Mayo back in the day, some sad etiquette. Um, okay. We touched, it taught the original PA workshop, it was called, back in the day, which has been replaced with a sad etiquette course and then was replaced by the motion picture industry orientation that now exists, which was actually just updated. I think they just rolled it out a few months ago. Um, but I've also taught you know, a lot of um, location courses over the years um, and... Um, more recently actually revamped and, and reauthored those same courses again. So there's an ALM course and an LM course. And um, I also teach leadership to our entry-level employees, which I love. That is great. Yeah, it's it's my happy place for sure. I love being in the <laughs> So, so uh, your dad uh, was the president of GGC? He was the chair locally back okay. in the day, and I could not quote you the years. And yeah. then, but it was right around the time that I got in. Okay. Um, so sort of, you know, 86, 87 ish. And, um, then he was actually, he ran for national chair and he was one of our few, if not our only national chair who was from the West. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So you just do, uh, provincially, you just do BC? Yeah. So the Directors Guild is a, is a national organization with right. a national entity in Toronto, but it also has district councils all across the country, um, Ontario and BC being two of the largest. 
Oh, that's how it works. Okay, I was unsure because mm-hmm. I knew it was a national thing, but I didn't know um, how it worked back and forth. I know they're like basically their own in- industries. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so. yeah. Hmm. Okay. And uh, so, how did you get the job at DGC? How did I get the job at the DGC? So I had over thirteen years of the period of time of that thirty years that I was um, working in locations. I had been sitting on the board. Oh, um, okay the whole time in the position of um, Locations Caucus rep. So I was the representative for the Locations Caucus on our board. And um, really, really loved the work that I was doing, loved, you know, having an impact on or an ability to impact people's, you know, working conditions and also the, you know, just the ability to sort of influence our collective agreement and all that kind of stuff from a board perspective, which was really interesting to me. And of course, because my father was one of the founding members of the DGCBC, I've always had just this really emotional connection to the organization as well. Right. And so I've been on the board for years and years. And when um, Crawford Hawkins, my predecessor, decided that he was going to retire, it seemed like a natural fit for me to apply. And they were kind enough to offer it. Were they saying, hey, apply, he's retiring? Yeah. Like it was like a a big family there? It is totally like a family here. It is the, I think, one of the happiest offices. Not that I've spent a ton of time in, in, you know, sort of corporate settings, but just a really, really happy office with a lot of really productive, amazing people all working as a super collaborative team. That is so sweet. Yeah, I don't really even know about it except for, like, there's a couple things I don't know about. Um, Mm -hmm. The difference between a guild and a union. I like. I'm kind of dumb when it comes to that. I don't know if, uh, but uh, when they say the directors' guild, this is the one that uh, is all the PAs, all the ADs, and director. That's right. So um, the DGC represents in BC, and it varies a bit across the country. But in BC, we represent directors, assistant directors, production managers, and the locations department, and uh, including production assistants and and also background coordinators, scouts. So we, oh, so that, we that, represent that makes kind sense. of the people who most support the director, most directly support the director in their role. Right. And um, the the difference between a union and a guild is sort of spurious. I mean, we are we're incorporated as a actually as a non profit organization. Oh. So the the employers recognize us as a union and we function as a union. So the the name guild is more a name than anything. I see. Okay, mm-hmm. that's what I was always I kind of curious about because I know you guys uh, um, um, represent that team or that uh, department oh. in the film. Mm-hmm. So, um, and uh, so w- when did the, do you know when the DGC started? Uh, well, I can tell you that the DGC in Ontario started, I'm going to say, um, late 60s, early 70s. Oh, okay. Our birth in this uh, province is formalized closer to the 80s, mm-hmm. and um, the dates are a little bit, uh, it's a little bit muddy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but... For maybe not quite what they are now. It was in place when you started in the film industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yes. When I started, there was already a, a guild, and it was it was in its infancy, but it was definitely already established and, and working. I was a very tiny little office on Hastings Street with, a, uh, you know, just a couple of people who worked out of it, and we're now a... Uh, 13 person office at the Broadway Tech Center so it's grown an enormous amount over those years. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you work tight with other unions? We do for sure, yeah. Um the all of the unions in BC and the film industry are in an organization together called the Association, which I love because it sounds very gangsterish. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> association. Not. Yeah. It sounds like a video game almost. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh, so, and we meet regularly. We meet on a monthly basis, and and work just enormously collaboratively. It's actually it's interesting when you go down to Los Angeles, and talk to our clients. It's one of the hallmarks of the industry here in BC that I don't think is repeated anywhere else that I'm aware of. Oh wow! Which is that we are we are enormously collaborative. We are the most collaborative uh, jurisdiction, and so you know, for example. MPO, which is the Motion Picture Production Industry Association, just to make it the longest possible thing on the <laughs> yeah. planet. Um, is Imagine that title or head, head on right. the thing. Eh? It, yeah, like your business card is 20 miles long. <laughs> um, but it's a it's a it's um, an amalgamation of all of the stakeholders in, in one organization. So, you know, everybody from facilities, studio facilities, your government, quasi-government organizations like Creative BC, all of the unions sit there, suppliers... Um, so it's really um, 
uh, it's really a coming together of absolutely everybody who has a vested interest in the industry. And uh, in November, we do a marketing trip down to Los Angeles every year. Right. And I hear it time and time again in those meetings with our clients that this um, collaborative approach where you have all of these people, including, by the way, people who are competing with each other. I mean, some of those studio facilities, for example, are... Oh, yeah potentially in direct competition, and yet they come together in a very collaborative way and go down to Los Angeles to market not themselves or their companies, but the actual jurisdiction of BC as a place to make films. Exactly. Like, in that case, we're all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, when I worked it, at Parallel, they, they would call Matrix, say, for stuff, and everyone works right. together in a way, even though they're competition. Yeah, and if you can't provide something, you're not going to say, oh, well, too bad, so sad. You tell them where the next phone call should be, right? Right. Which I think is a big part of what, you know, truly makes us such a full-service um, jurisdiction for the industry and makes us so popular and people continue to come back again and again. Wow, yeah. It seems to be because it's growing like crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I mean, even just, I would say, in the three years that I've been in this office since January, three, three and a half years, since January of 2016, there's been quite a lot of growth, but sort of that period between... 2014, 15 through till 20, you know, 18 has been just humongous, explosive growth. Oh yeah, just just crazy. I just had an interview with um, uh, um, a cinematographer out of Toronto, and she was saying that uh, it's exploding there because it's so full here that every you know productions are going there now to yeah. because and it's just filling up and it's getting to a point where they're busting at the seams almost. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely a, it becomes a. A challenge to manage the resources, right? And that's one of the things that this organization is heavily involved in is this um, sort of, again, risen out of the MPA um, stakeholder table is a group called the Motion Picture Community Initiative, which is really focused on, you know, managing and trying to give back a little bit, uh, thank the communities that make filming in, in Vancouver, particularly on location, possible. Because, you know, as we all know, without those locations and their willingness to have us in their midst, we would be dead. Oh, yeah, no, that's Creative BC and the Film Commission and all this stuff working in one harmonizing thing. So uh, uh, it it draws in the business. It becomes that's a right. collaborative thing that they want. They actually, because, uh, so, so so what you're saying is other parts of the states, they, they compete and it's like a tribal thing, like they don't work together? No, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, you're talking about the different parts of the city, right? Different communities. No, I'm talking about L.A. or other parts of the country. Um, oh. Compared to us being a collaborative here in B.C., is it is it different in other places? Have you noticed? Because you said that a lot of people uh, give you compliments saying, oh, my God, you guys work yeah. together. I don't know that they're necessarily hyper-competitive in other parts of the country, but I do think that they don't work together in quite the same um, sort of uh, um, orchestrated way, I guess right. is what I would say. You know, that here in B.C. we have this, because we have the central stakeholder organization in MPA, which is such an amazing, um, you know, opportunity and com- coming together of everybody for the greater good of the province and the industry, mm-hmm. uh, I think it really pulls us and, and gives us an ability to, to work together in a much more, um, like I said, orchestrated kind of way. And I think that that is that doesn't seem to be duplicated in other provinces. Not to say that people aren't cooperative and supportive of one another. Oh, yeah. I don't think they have quite the same sort of infrastructure for it that we have managed to create here in BC. And you know, the the, the MPA, the model that is the Motion Picture Production Industry Association, started, I mean, its predecessor was the um, BC MPA, I think it was called, or no, sorry, BC, oh, I can't remember the, the um, acronym. But anyways, I mean, it's it's been a long time in the making. That organization has grown over time and has really grown up to be, I think, an extremely complete, um, you know, picture. There's very few people who don't, or very few sectors that don't have a voice at that table, which is great, right? Because it means that when we go to that table and talk about issues, you're hearing all sides of it. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. stuff like the uh, Real Green program or things like that, where yeah. everyone is on the same page. And that makes the communication makes it run so much smoother. Yeah, absolutely. Like I was listening to Claire George talk on the radio the other day um, as a producer in Vancouver, and she was talking about having asked for, you know, letters of support when she was going to the parks board to talk about, you know, greening, uh, you know, putting in power drops in different parks and different locations um, so that we're not having to use generators in the industry. Right. And how quickly she was able to gather letters of support. It's, it is astounding and amazing how 
um, you know, truly dedicated and, and, and um, committed, I think, the entire community is to that uh, that approach. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea, actually putting, uh, th- so you don't have to drag out a diesel run Jenny every time, generator every time, and uh, and, and pollute the, the atmosphere. You can actually yeah. just plug straight into the city power or whatever. To the grid. That's mm-hmm. right. And I mean, you know, aside from the obvious, you know, um, a benefit of using a green, greener power source. Um, but there's also the reality that Jenny's are a footprint on the street, right? And so the more we can eliminate that, the better off we are in other ways as well. Oh, you mean like for parking, you have to make space for yeah. them when you're uh, when right. you, location manager? Because, yeah, you've <laughs> been a location manager for so long that you think of it that way when you approach a set. That's right. Absolutely. So, the, the you know, the more you can reduce that footprint, the less impact you're having on the local, you know, merchants and businesses and that's a good thing wow um uh do you have any advice for people who are pas or just getting into film um and just starting out because a lot of the my listeners are people who are like i said just starting and um and a lot of people give advice as far as uh, um what you should do when you just are getting on set or doing your own independent productions or anything like that yeah i mean i think first of all it's all about the attitude, right? When new people come into this industry, I think that until you get in, you, you know, don't realize that it's not the glamour of the film industry is not alive and well on set. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Film sets are, are tough places to work with, you know, honestly long hours. And um, I don't think that it's something that that uh, is worth it if you don't have a, a real, um, you know, sort of heartfelt reason to be there. I mean, for me, it was my, my familial connection to the industry. And um, so I think it's just you got to look for where your passion is and find that department in the industry that is is going to drive you to be able to do those kind of hours. And um, my other advice is start putting away in your piggy bank now because, you know, it is a cyclical industry. And even though we're in a huge boom time right now, um, you know, when we look historically back, we see every however many years it used to be 10. But I think that's expanding and changing now particularly with all of the new players that have come into the industry. All the streaming and content stuff, yeah. So the content, the thirst for content in the, um, you know, in the world as a whole is humongous right now, so it's really disrupted that cycle. But the truth is there's still a cycle, right? It's all tied to the economy, and likely there will be a downturn eventually. And so I think it's really important for people to realize, especially now, you know, people are coming in now, haven't worked through a lean time and don't see it coming and when and if it does come it's i think it can take you by surprise that suddenly there isn't any you know any job to be had so i think it's important for people to just create a little bit of a pad for themselves financially oh yeah i remember the last writer strike i got lucky and i ended up working at bridge studio and working for the studio so yeah. i had a I'd steady work but a lot of productions had a real hard time and uh, it dried up for a while there i didn't know how long it was it was yeah, months though said- six months or something yeah, that's and that's really fortunate to have a full time job in a setting like that because when you've got, I mean, you know, the industry's got some forty thousand employees. Yeah. And where are they all going to go if yeah. there's a downturn? And you know, in BC, unlike um, Ontario, we don't have the same high level of uh, non foreign, you know, local domestic production happening. Although, goodness knows, we'd all love to make that happen, and we're all, you know, looking for ways to bolster that all the time, right? Uh, and build it, but. The truth is, there's not going to be, you know, if, if, if the Americans disappeared, there's not going to be 100 productions going on here. So. Oh, yeah, no. If, if, the, the, uh, um, the, the biggest thing about BC, I find, is just that, that it's so beautiful and there's so much to look at. But if locations yeah. dry up or things happen, it can happen. It can dry up and there's no work. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, with the... Studios are combining now and merging, and oh, yeah. it's just—it's you know—it's not as—it's uh, not an, an undependable industry by any stretch of the imagination. I just think people need to plan because you know something shifts and you're taken by surprise. Well, and that's the other thing too is I know so many people that go to other places. They go to Toronto to do a commercial. They go to mm-hmm. Denmark. They go to wherever. It does—it's not all just filmed here. It's just that we have a lot of quality people here who really know their stuff. That's right. I mean, Vancouver is. Uh, you know, has a plethora of world-class crews. We have members who are, you know, production managers, first ADs, first ADs that work all over the world, directors that go all over the world yep. to work, even though they're based out of BC. And, you know, all of the unions are uh, similarly, um, you know, staffed by really incredibly talented members, people who've won awards, people who've won Academy Awards. 
and yeah. uh, you know make their living all over the world. So. It's it's quite astounding. I uh, when I first started, it, it it blew me away about how big it was. Because if you if you don't if you're not in the film industry, you don't know how big it is. You don't know how far it reaches, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a lot bigger than I imagined. Yeah, it's definitely it's grown incredibly over the time that I've been in it for sure. And um, I think too that those connections the world over are. It's really interesting. We were just having actually a. A forum here at the end of May um, in cooperation with the Location Managers Guild International, which is out of Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and um, the DGC themselves and the Motion Picture Community Initiative got together and hosted this big forum. And we had, you know, we had locations people from all over the world. We had Robbie Folks here speaking, who is the supervising location manager on Game of Thrones, and oh, we had wow. Georgia Turner out of the UK, and all these amazing people. And what was so interesting, you know, I mean, the Location Managers Guild is very focused on, first of all, I think, um, really illuminating and highlighting the art of working in locations because it's such a logistical job. Like, there's so many logistics, especially in a, you know, big city like the city of Vancouver. Oh, yeah. That it's easy to lose sight of the fact that, first and foremost, that is a creative department that is tasked with finding the right locations to tell the story that they're trying to tell. And so the Location Managers Guild really sprang from trying to illuminate and highlight that particular perspective. Um, But they're really uh, focused on connecting locations people the world over. And this forum that we had recently was just such a great example of that. So, um, So many amazing people in the room telling stories and realizing that as much as, you know, it's different to make a movie in Northern Ireland, as Robbie Boke would tell you, to doing it here, mm-hmm. a lot of the same issues are still there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's sort of like the more things change, the more they stay the same. And um, and speaking of connections, I thought it was so interesting that he was here for this, um, this forum that we did, went home, and like two weeks later came back and went and did a fam tour of... Um, of uh, um, the North uh, Northwest Territories with um, the film commissioner from up there, Kamala McEachran and Ken Brooker. Nice. And so that you know, you talk about connections. Here you've got this guy who's a you know location manager in Northern Ireland suddenly, you know, running around all over the north of of BC. Well, yeah, but those are those are like expansive and vast uh, uh, landscapes. It's really yeah. wild because I imagine uh, um, it is similar to Ireland. I would imagine. Yes, in its scope, but not in its look. Oh, okay. No, no. I think there's. It, he was really blown away. I mean, they went to Nahani National Park, which is just breathtakingly beautiful. And in the same way that I think when we go to a place like Ireland, we're so blown away by how different it is. And you know, yeah, that's we're... one of the beauties of being in locations. Is you get <laughs> to go to such amazing places. I oh, mean, when it's I so think different. Of the things yeah. That I've gotten to do in my career because I was working in locations. It's, you know, it's amazing. Walked on the roof of BC Place Stadium. How many people are going to get to see that in their life? Oh, yeah. How many times I, I wa- was walking on the roof of just skyscrapers downtown yeah. and because I worked on Arrow and it was all rooftops and uh, yeah. no one gets to do that. I've really seen a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. And I'm rooftops sure you and breaking too. windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, when I worked on uh, Supernatural for a couple of years, and that was a road show, and they had to make it look different every single time. Yeah. And uh, there were so many places in Vancouver, but obviously they have a really good DP <laughs> because yeah. you have to imagine it and make it look different every single time for yeah. years on end. Another example of how Vancouver talent is uh, out there doing its work, fooling people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, has uh. Has there been any change in uh, um, uh, uh, women getting involved in film over oh, the great. years since you've started? Because great I question. know that was uh, that was really uh, um, probably an intimidating thing when you first started for women to get involved because it was a I don't know if it was a guy's thing actually, but uh, um, from what I've had a friend that I interviewed and she works at uh, she's the vice president of women in film. And, yeah. and we kind of touched on that subject. So uh, who would better know better than you? I, I thought yeah. I'd ask you about it. I mean, it definitely has changed and shifted an enormous amount. I mean, when I started, and, and not to say, um, you know, there weren't women. There have been women pioneering their way into this industry for years and years and years. Right. Um, for sure. And, 
Uh, you know, certainly I worked with some amazing women over the years that I, uh, you know, was working in locations, but it's definitely gotten more. And I even just look at the classes that I teach and how much more diverse, how many more women and also how many more people of color are in those rooms. It's really heartening to see slow, slow change, mm -hmm. um, particularly from, you know, different cultures standpoints. But Still, it's great to see the industry broadening out and becoming more inclusive because, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's been a bit of a, an old boys club for sure. Well, uh, that's what I thought. I mean, back in those days, it was uh, there was only so many productions, too, and they would, you know, hire people. It wasn't like people could do their own thing. But um, yeah. when I first started, it was The Watchmen. <laughs> that was my first uh, yeah. time in film. And uh, yeah. and you were LM on that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, but... Uh, Ever since um, I started, I, I was telling my friend Shannon that uh, I never really noticed any any problem with gender parity or any sort of thing because um, it had grown so much. And I said over half of my bosses were women. I've never mm -hmm. seen any sort of um, people being held back or not yeah. making the same money, that kind of thing. Like those those laws and those, those things must uh, be evolved within the unions. Yeah, I mean, when we look at the at the stats within our own numbers, certainly, you know, locations is one of the departments where there's lots of women have been doing the job of locations and location manager for many, many years. Lots of female scouts out there. Okay. Um, and so that, I mean, I'm not going to say it's 100% 50-50, but for sure there is, you know, lots of people who are in that, lots of women who are in those roles. Um, and I think that's true of the assistant directing um, department as well. It's really, uh, you know, directing is where, you know, we're really trying to build those numbers because, that, you know, that is where we've seen, you know, some pretty sad stats in terms of female, um, you know, representation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I, of uh... course, you know, directors are the voice of the industry, so you really want that to be as inclusive as possible. And um, we're actually soon to be launching a campaign here at the DGC that I can't talk too much about because it's still under wraps. Okay. But um, watch for it early September. We're going to be launching a, an initiative to promote BC directors. And uh, we're very, very excited about that. And, and, you know, part of that is to promote diversity and try to create a more inclusive workplace, a more inclusive industry. That is sure. great. Um, yeah. Do you think uh, um, it's, it's the same everywhere? Because you uh, travel around to different places they film, or is it just within BC or is it within Canada? We're trying to. I, uh... I don't think that I don't think that the lack of diversity in the industry is specific to any one part of the world. I okay. Think that, you know, I think we have to, as an industry, get better at engaging different communities for sure. Um, you know, reaching out to, you know, right from high school but up into film schools, and uh, you know, allowing allowing those communities access into an industry that and you know i don't think it's, it's not anything that was in any way ever you know done intentionally no. but the truth is when it gets busy and we build our ranks it's because it's busy and people are out there going okay who am i going to hire and you know they hire their friend or their relative or their and you end up with a, a you know fairly um you know commonality in looks among your crew right, right? You yeah, yeah, yeah people that are all the same as opposed to being more active and, and aggressive about, you know, going out to film schools, for example, or going out to high schools and saying, hey, you know, this is a great industry for anybody in any community, and please come and join us. And, um, you know, also uh, reaching out more actively, for sure, to our, our First Nations, um, you know, community in B.C. Yes, that's it, been it, growing a lot. Yeah, and, and it really, those voices need to be heard, right? So. Oh yeah, those, those there's some crazy stories for sure. Uh, I've yeah. been paying attention to quite a bit of the uh, those films, and um, uh, as as time's gone on, uh, um, I've not noticed any sort of change or any sort of you know it, it's been all different, um, all different genders and all different colors and all different everything. It's just, it just comes down to the type of person you are. I believe mm -hmm. it's you have to be able to not only endure that kind of work in hours but have the passion to jump right on it again, you know? And um, yeah. I think a lot of people who fall in love with the idea of being a celebrity or getting involved with some sort of celebrity thing, that's what's, you know, the stars are in their eyes and that's why they come to film, but then they realize after about a year, I don't want to stand out there as a PA for, <laughs> in the rain, yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's like I said, it's not the, I think it's, 
as an industry, as a business, it's not quite as glamorous as it comes across when you're watching it on TV or you're, you know, watching the uh, the Oscars. That's a completely different world oh, than yeah. the actual day to day of making movies, right? Oh yeah, I I really enjoyed the the friendliness and. Uh, the helpfulness that uh, uh, came with working in the film industry. It was so, so new to me. I've worked in uh, different warehouses and had labor jobs and whatnot. And then when yeah. I came to this, it, uh, you know, it, I was embraced and I was brought into uh, uh, as long as you do your job really well, we'll take care of you kind of thing. And it, it was really refreshing. Yeah. It's one of the wonderful things about film. You know, we were talking about this office earlier and I'd say about half of our employees here are film folks as well. But you know, that family thing that I was talking about that we have here. I mean, the whole industry is like that. Right. And it is really lovely to be, uh, it's funny, I was just teaching yesterday, I was teaching a leadership class, and I was asking, you know, has anybody worked on a, a show of hands? Has anybody worked on a show where they really, really felt like you had what we, you describe as flow, you know, where, like, you feel like the other people on your team are reading your mind. You're like, oh, yeah, we need to book then. They're like, oh, we already did that. Or, yeah. You know what I mean? And people love that. Like, oh. when you can find that place where everybody is just, so, um, you know, functionally connected and supporting one another and the team is, you know, taking care of each other. That There's nothing like it. Oh, you know, that's no. That's the best workplace you could possibly hope for. It, it's something that blew my mind and I experienced firsthand. Same thing. I uh, I did this one show. I'll just leave names out, but I did this one show and it was okay. difficult and <laughs> it seemed to be, um, excuse me, um, seemed to be a, a challenge a lot of the time and departments wouldn't communicate quite so well and mm -hmm. just just things like transport doesn't like the locations or whatever, you know, and all these things happened and I did that for a while and then I went to this other show and it wasn't like that at all. And everyone got along. Everything was great. Yeah. It was like, as soon as I walk in the office and I, I'm looking for something, there's someone handing it to me going, oh, yeah. I knew you were coming for this. And they're... It uh, makes all the difference for sure. It sure does, yeah. Um, but uh, that exists across the board. Like sometimes you get on a show and you're like, "Holy, this is really horrible." And I'm sure yeah. you've had your shows like that where you're like, "Oh my god, I can't wait till I get out of here. I'm done with this yeah. contract." Right? Yeah, there's you know every so often you hit on one where it's like, "Oh, this is a slog." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you you had a team, didn't you? Didn't you have people that followed yeah, you around? Absolutely. Like you and, had ALMs and. and yeah, I'm very, very fortunate to work with some of the, I think, most talented locations people in the city, people like, you know, Gina Johnson and yeah, Ken Gina Brooker and, yeah. and Hans Bayal and oh, Hans. Peter Klaas and just, and, you know, Kitu Kearney mm -hmm. and just amazing people, um, you know, that care and really, really get it, you know, just are really are so passionate and care so much and so talented, you know. Oh, they're... Most of those names you just named off are right on the money. Uh, when I started working at Parallel, or it's it's owned by Whites now, so it's Whites Les. Um, yeah. I uh, I would go out and it, like some of those people, even Gina, I, I would show up and do stuff that a van driver would do. You know yeah. what I mean? Because yeah. they're so passionate about what they're doing, they don't care. I go out to a no, place to get your hands dirty. And, yeah. the, and the LM will just jump out of his car and help me with the the plywood real quick. You know, yeah. like, yeah, absolutely. didn't, didn't have an ego, didn't say I'm better than you and I'm, you know, wait for the PAs or whatever. Um, that's right. And that's so, uh, uh, enlightening and, and I love that kind of people. Yeah. It's refreshing, isn't it? It's, I mean, it is one of the, I think one of the very, very best things about the industry is, um, you know, that kind of family connectedness, people caring for each other and taking care of the team and. It doesn't happen on every single show, but when it happens, it feels so good. It does. And uh, and then when you talk to someone who is, it's almost like a certain type of person. I mean, you get to know someone and you talk to them, they're like, oh, I know that person. Oh, I know that person. And then yeah. it just, the connections go. It's almost like social media before the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank you very much for doing this with me. Uh, um, uh, is there anything you uh, else you want to talk about? I, I, I just uh, touched on all the questions I had written. No, out. I think it's, I think uh, it was really lovely talking to you. It was great to have an opportunity to uh, talk about an industry that I love so much, and I just really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I love talking to Kendry. She's so nice. Uh, everybody have a great week and weekend, and I will talk to you next Monday. Take care. <laughs>